film lovers, we're back. And as always, we're Off, off the, the cuff. cuff. I'm Felicia Haney with Kevin KT Taylor. And we're here with a behind the lens look on what happens in the wonderful world of G Cuff or the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival. This year, G Cuff celebrates 11 years of black film life and culture. Catch us this September 15th through the 23rd as we showcase the best in black film and immersive storytelling. Be sure to visit GCuff at gcuff.org for tickets and more info and all of your movie going needs. So today we have a special treat. We are live with writer, uh, director, uh, man, this, this guy has so many accolades. <laughs> I, was, I was reading his bio like, uh, oh my goodness, like, what, does it ever end? You know, but that's a great thing. I, I, that's no shade there. We're not throwing any shade. But we are here speaking with Terrence Affer Anderson, who is the writer and director of The Black Walnut. Welcome, Terrence. Welcome. Oh, thank you so Thank you so very much. Delighted to be here. Great. Great. I have never heard the last name Affer before that I can think of. It sounds like very, a very interesting last name. Is there, uh, what's the origin of that? Yeah, there's quite a story behind it. Actually, uh, Terrence Affer Anderson is my brand. My name is Terrence Affer, but uh, many years ago when I was a student at the uh, DC Black Rep, uh, I was uh, an acting student there, but one of the, uh, the instructors came to me and asked me, had I ever heard of Terrence Affer? And I hadn't. And uh, so I did a little bit of research and I found out that uh, there was a African playwright who was born around 190 BC, who went mm. to Rome at the age of six. Uh, he learned Latin and at 16, he wrote his first play. Uh, this is over 2000 years ago. Yeah, he was an African playwright uh, and six of his plays still survive today, 2000 years later. His name was Publius Terentius Afer, which is Latin for Terence, the writer from Africa. Uh, Afra is Latin for from Africa or of Africa. And uh, Shakespeare credits him with being uh, influenced on his life. Uh, he came around some, some 1400 years before Shakespeare. Um, and the very first professional female, female playwright was a nun by the name of Robitha. Uh, and she launched her career by doing critiques of Terence's plays. Uh, and the, um, the, the brother, even more than 2,000 years ago, as you can well imagine, was uh, uh, people were questioning his, uh, his ability to write. And uh, he was given to standing up before performances of his plays to defend his work. Um, and I just wanted to hyphenate uh, his last name with my own so that I could share a little bit of obscure history about an African playwright who lived over 2,000 years ago. He was from mm -hmm. Carthage, uh, Africa. Okay. That is an amazing story, and I've never heard that. Not, like, not only had I not heard the last name before, I've never heard that story. So that is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and, and with our viewers. And, and Terrence, what's, what's cool about it, too, is, is that this is your first feature film, but you are a playwright, right? That's your lane, right? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, I, uh, I've written over 20 plays I've been produced, and... San Francisco, uh, and Las Vegas, and Washington, D.C., and, uh, of course, quite a bit here in Hampton Roads and, and Norfolk, Virginia. Okay, so have you ever reinterpreted uh, Terrence the writer from Africa's, any of his plays? Uh, no, no, I, I haven't. Uh, and that's a good question. That's something I should think about. <laughs> and I think there, there may have been, at one point, I thought about producing uh, one of his plays. Um, and, and they're basically short pieces, um, but uh, that's something I should think about even more because I've not done that, you know? And we shared the same first name, you know, his name was Terrence. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And he had African heritage. That, well, he was African and I have African heritage. Um, Absolutely. So that's, a good, that's a good question, brother. I appreciate that. No problem. Let's, let's talk more about, you know, your journey into from playwright into filmmaking. So you you did a number of shorts and, and I think you did some PBS, uh, not PBS, uh, some PSAs, PSA, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I retired from the Virginia Department of Health um, back in 2016. And um, I was the chief 
uh, marketing, public relations, and media writer for the uh, for the Norfolk Department of Public Health. Uh, and basically, I wrote uh, uh, news releases, you know, and uh, other news stories. I wrote feature stories. Uh, um, but I also hosted a, a television talk show called Health Watch. I did that for uh, for some 16 years. Um, but I, I think that the 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 writing book. Uh, is relentless in me, okay? I will probably be writing until I, I, I can't uh, write anymore. Um, and so I got this idea to start producing public service announcements. They had not really done much of that. And I produced public ser service announcements as what I call microfilm. You remember, remember microfilm from the days of yours some time ago? Um, mm -hmm. I, I come from a newspaper background, so I know all about that. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so my films were, I call them um, microfilms, uh, microscopic films, because they were uh, only 30 or 60 seconds long. Uh, but like a film, they had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, the most successful one uh, was something called DATE, uh, and the acronym is uh, D-A-T-E, for Daryl in Asia, uh, Troubles Escalate. Um, and I say it was the most uh, eventful one because it was shown during a uh, during local telecast of NFL and NBA playoff games uh, and the 2006 Super Bowl. Uh, so it, it got a lot of attention. That it was about uh, it was uh, about dating violence, uh, and uh, frankly, there was no dialogue in this 60-second uh, piece uh, until the voiceover came in at the end. Um, so I think that by doing those public service uh, announcements, uh, I was um, wetting my appetite for doing film and, and unaware of that because I was still very deep in uh, doing a lot of theater. Uh, I produced plays for the, uh, the North Department of Public Health to include a play uh, called Railings about a, uh, a runaway teen who encounters the spirit of a 19th century African-American cowboy on a freight train. Um, a, um, a courtroom drama called The Sight and Six, uh, which was about HIV and AIDS. Um, and so I would deal with uh, uh, plays, uh, write plays uh, for the health department that dealt with uh, medical issues. Um, but uh, I've, I've found that I have a real passion for film. Um, I, you know, I did my first feature again in 2019 and I've done one play since 2019, and I was doing five plays a season. Okay. Wow. Now, would you say that it slowed you down from doing plays because making a film is a beast, right? Especially if it's your first time doing it? Uh, yeah, uh, making a film is, uh, you know, it's a time-intensive process. For, uh, for this particular film, The Black Walnut, it took me about uh, six months. Um, but the, the, there's always going to be a, uh, a, a draw, uh, an attraction, uh, a relentless pull to doing theater because it's a live experience. There is uh, something uh, that's quite remarkable about the exchange of energy between a live audience and mm -hmm. the, um, you know, and, and the, the actors on stage. Uh, and, uh, and you turn the stage into a, a completely separate environment. Uh, and the folks in the audience are looking through what we call the fourth wall, that invisible wall uh, that separates the, uh, the, the actors from the, the audience. So there's always going to be a pull there. But the, the one advantage that I like about film that you could not have with live theater is that um, with the camera, uh, you can get with the, 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 the lens, the camera, you can, the, the proximity that you can get to the to the actors, uh, to the you know, to the actors, is something that you cannot get with the human with the naked eye. So what you can use that you can use that to make a very a very specialized environment, a very uh, intense environment. Um, and I, I think that uh, so much so uh, that uh, where you can have a dramatic pause on the live stage, uh, you can do a piece without dialogue for film and still tell the story. You can do that with stage, but um, you can't do it so effectively as you can with film. Uh, and the other thing about film is that, uh, you know, when you use multiple locations, um, it, 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 it inspires and uh, uh, it intrigues the imagination of the viewer. You know, it, it, the viewer 
uh, kind of lives vicariously through the performers. That, that is, of course, contingent upon the story told, too. Right. So let's talk more specifically about The Black Walnut. What, what compelled you to do that film specifically? In 2009, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, at that particular time, I had been working as a volunteer, uh, public relations and marketing committee chair for the American Cancer Society, the African American Men's Health Forum. I was doing this as a volunteer through the North Department of Public Health. And so I was where I needed to be. But as it happened, I, I always try and be very dutiful when it comes to the, the maintenance of my own health care, uh, regular doctor visits and, and, and everything. And, uh, and I was still all that I needed to do. Um, and so when I was diagnosed, I had the, uh, the great benefit of a, a early diagnosis. Um, and so because I had that early diagnosis, I had great benefit of multiple treatment options. Um, uh, the option that I chose was something called brachytherapy. That's where they implant radioactive seeds right into the cancer. Um, but when I was diagnosed, um, I shared that news with my two brothers. I have uh, one brother older and one brother younger. And um, neither of them had ever been screened. And so they both were screened. And my eldest brother was diagnosed with a later stage of prostate cancer than I. And oh, because, no. because he got the word from me, that was why he got screened. And so that really impressed upon me the importance of getting the word out about the benefit of, uh, of early detection. I already was well informed about the, the incidents of the uh, prostate cancer disparity in the African American community, um, but, uh, and, and was aware of the importance of getting the word out. But when it, it touched me personally uh, with my brother being diagnosed, uh, that gave me a, a greater impetus. Now, I've done public service announcement uh, about the African American prostate cancer disparity. I've done a, a mini documentary about it. I've spoken about it on my show, uh, Health Watch, uh, a few times. Um, but uh, just prior to my retirement from the health department, I had the great fortune of being uh, accepted into a fellowship program by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Culture of Health Leaders Program. And it's a three-year program, and we had to choose a health area that we were going to focus on. And for me, the obvious choice was the African American prostate cancer disparity. Uh, and originally, as a playwright, I was going to do a play um, but frankly, uh, someone kind of took my idea for a play hostage. Oh, so, wow. yeah, come up, but, but it was meant to be uh, because I had to come up with an alternative idea, and that was the film. Um, this project has been on a very circuitous, roundabout journey um, because when I um, the I wrote a, sc a screenplay prior to uh, this particular one. And I wanted to do something uh, that was called Walnut Mountain. And uh, I was featuring a gentleman who was uh, six foot 10 inches tall, uh, who was a uh, remarkable prostate cancer uh, advocate, uh, you know, early advocate for early detection. And he was also a, 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 a giant when it came to helping me not navigate my own uh, experience. Um, and I did an autobiographical piece and they wanted to make some changes, which was fine because it was my first screenplay. Um, but he brought in another uh, screenwriter and um, uh, and I didn't have any issue working with her because it was my first uh, feature in the screenplay. Uh, but she couldn't work with my deadline for the, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, for the project that I had to turn in for the fellowship. Uh, so I had to go off in a <laughs> completely different direction. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, you may have seen a trailer, uh, it's a preview film, it's, uh, I'll call it a preview rather than a typical trailer because it's just under seven minutes long. Uh, the trailer, uh, I wrote the trailer before I had any idea of what I was going to write the script because <laughs> I had to turn something in. So mm -hmm. I wrote this trailer and I, uh, I featured you know, several actors and uh, then the idea really flourished. Uh, about how to tell the story. Um, and it occurred to me that to tell a comprehensive story, uh, to paint a comprehensive portrait of the African-American prostate cancer disparity, I needed to 
create a fictionalized character so that I could touch upon every area, um, you know, of the prostate cancer disparity. Um, but what I also did, though, and this is what makes it a novel piece, is that I brought in six, actually I brought in nine prostate cancer survivors to portray themselves in the film. So they were acting as themselves in the film uh, and telling their own stories in the context of the film, in the context of this fictionalized story. Um, and at the end of the film, uh, they uh, did their, their on-camera testimonials during the uh, credits roll. Uh, and I think that that's what makes it uh, such a novel piece um, and that uh, people uh, are really attracted to it. I, I have very confidence that the film is saving lives. Uh, I spoke with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin, who would be uh, on the panel after the film is shown on the 18th of uh, next month. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Charles Martin. Charles Martin. Mm -hmm. He spoke with great conviction that the film is saving lives because it's prompting black men to be screened for prostate cancer that have never been screened before. And a number of them are, you know, uh, are coming back with a uh, diagnosis of late stage prostate cancer, uh, but they can they can battle it once they know that they have it. Uh, so that's, that's basically the genesis of the film and why I talk with such uh, exuberance about it, because again, it's been a uh, uh, quite a circuitous journey, it really too. Very close to home. Right. Now, will you be joining us in Cleveland? Oh, yes. Yeah, coming out on uh, the 17th. Okay. All right. Good that's stuff. A, yep. That's a great pairing with you and Dr. Marlin. He's done a lot for black men in their health care in the city and, and, and specifically in prostate cancer area and everything. So we are looking forward to having you here. And this has been a great conversation. Yes. So Kevin and I, we like trivia. And so we ask some um, questions sometimes at the end of these episodes. So our uh, trivia question is, uh, what does G-Cup stand for? Uh, Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival. Hey. hey. All right, all right, all right. I, I, I had better known the answer to that, right? <laughs> We, we got to check. We got, we got a guy over there about to pull your film from the festival if you didn't know. <laughs> and my next question is, if someone says, behold, what, what would be your reply? The green and gold. That's right. <laughs> Shout out to Norfolk State University, my uh, alma mater. And, uh, oh, so you, did go, you did go to school there. I did, yes. When, when were you there? Oh, I don't. He made that mistake. He made he made a mistake. He made a faux pas. He was about to kind of tag in on your age. He, he understands. Oh, we, you we, about we, to ask <laughs> the graduation dates and things? Mm -mm. No, 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 no. <laughs> You was on the roll here. Now don't don't go backwards. <laughs> yeah, but I lived. Um, I used to live out by the beach of the first colonial exit, and then I lived off Newtown Road. So made some lifelong friends there, and. Um, yeah, that's home. I go to homecoming uh, pretty often and great, great place. Near and dear to the heart. Yeah, Norfolk is a uh, is an interesting city. Um, again, I'm a Norfolk native. Uh, I was born in a uh, uh, project community called Liberty Park. We didn't realize it was a project at the time. And and, and, and that's not really fair because uh, in this community, there were blue collar workers as well as uh, uh, high school teachers and college professors and physicians. Um, but you know, what's something very interesting, and I didn't realize this until, I guess maybe about uh, a year ago, I had forgotten because I was such a little guy, but I think that probably a great influence on my interest in film was my father. When I was a little kid, we lived again in a, uh, uh, it looked like a project, and we lived in the end unit. And my father used to make films, okay, home movies. And he would show him, and, and uh, we were in the end unit, and so there was a big field next to our house. And my father, at nighttime, would show his home movies on the side of our house. And people, wow. were, gathering, people were gathering in the field to watch his movies. Wow. And I, had, I had forgotten that. <laughs> That is amazing. You are just full of great 
tidbits and stories. I love it. So I can see why you've been so successful as a playwright and, and now a filmmaker. Well, thank you. are looking forward to having you. That's so your nice. film is planned in the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival, and you're actually going to be here. That's another bonus for our, our listeners, our viewers, and our uh, patrons that attend the festival. We look forward to having you. Will this be your first time in Cleveland? Uh, yes, it will. Oh, wow. Great. So we're excited. We plan to show you a great time, and you're going to show us a great film. And, um, yeah, can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. I really, truly am. Uh, can you tell our viewers how to keep up with you? Um, how can they stay connected to you and um, follow the film, etc.? Well, I'm on Facebook. I, uh, I think I'm at my limit uh, or near my limit of friends on Facebook. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm also on Instagram and uh, LinkedIn uh, as Terrence Zachary Anderson uh, on, uh, on Instagram as Zachary Anderson. Uh, but uh, a, a great way to, to learn a little bit more about my work is to visit my website, uh, and that's TerraVision, www.terrav, like Victor, I-Z, as in zebra, I-O-N-I-N-C.com, TerraVisionInc.com. And uh, you can see, you won't see all of my plays there, but you'll see a good number of my plays. You'll see... Uh, uh, some uh, some of my journalism pieces. I wrote a story on uh, Ruth Carter, the Oscar winner. Uh, I interviewed her for a piece. Uh, she won an Oscar for the Black Panther. Um, I interviewed um, Bernadette Stannis from Good Times. Okay. And, uh, what's the sister's name? Oh my God, she will kill me. So I'm, I'm not even going to say what she was doing, but she was a national television star. Okay. Um, oh, well, we're going to look for it, so no worries. Yeah, we will definitely check out the site and look for you. Um, can't wait to see you in Cleveland. Once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And, um, Kevin, did you have anything else? Um, thank you for being on Off the Cuff. We look forward to having you. Uh, thank right. you so much for being by that, Julie. Appreciate it. Yep. Have a good one. Thank you, guys. This has been thank another you. episode of Off the Cuff with Felicia Haney and Kevin Taylor. Make sure to follow us on all social media platforms at GCuff Cleveland, and we'll catch you behind the lens. Behind the lens.